Hello, and welcome to the fourth installment of First Chapter Fridays. Uh, this week, I am going to read from Alan Gratz's new book called Grenade. Uh, many of you have read his stories before and have really fallen in love with them. The most recent one that has been super popular was Refugee. So I figured several of my students might be interested in his newest uh, historical fiction novel. Uh, we also have a couple copies already in the library. So if this interests you, you can uh, come check out the full novel. So, Hideki, The End, April 1st, 1945. An American bomb landed 100 meters away. Karakum! And the school building exploded. Hideki Kanishiro ducked and screamed with all the other boys as they were showered with rocks. In splinters, Hideki couldn't believe it. One minute his school was there, the next it was gone. Worse, the bombs meant the American battleships had found them. He turned to run. Don't move! Nobody move! Hideki froze. Every atom of his being told him to run, to find a cave somewhere to hide. But Lieutenant Colonel Sano's voice was so commanding, so forceful, that he didn't move. No one did not even the governor of Okinawa, who was already three steps toward a shelter, stopped in his tracks. Return to your ranks, Lieutenant Colonel Sano yelled. Hideki inched back into the line with the other boys and stood at attention, his heart pounding. Takeshi, another fourth-year boy, whimpered softly beside him. Katsumasa, who is Takeshi's best friend, stood ramrod straight, a bead of sweat rolling down his face. What's the matter, babies? Yoshio whispered from the row of students behind them. Ready to run home to mommy? Hideki's neck burned hot with shame for being scared. Yoshio was a fifth-year boy who had made it his personal mission to terrorize all the fourth-year boys, especially Hideki. Yoshio was half a head taller than Hideki, with arms as big as tree trunks and a face full of chickenpox scars that made him look twice as old. Hideki had always been the smallest boy in the school, and Yoshio had never let him forget it. Hideki was 14 years old, but he looked like he was 12, with a round, boyish face, thin arms and legs, and short, cropped black hair. Hideki had to keep an ear open for whatever stunt Yoshio might pull behind him and the rest of him was transfixed on what was happening in front of him. If he could have moved without being scolded, Hedeki would have made a rectangle with his fingers like a photographer had shown him once to frame a picture of what he was seeing and what a picture it would have made. A hundred boys stood in a small clearing outside what was left of their middle school. All of them wore their tan Imperial Japanese Army uniforms and caps. It was almost two o'clock in the morning and it was dark. The ground shook with the heavy bombs of artillery shells falling all around them, fired by American battleships offshore. A single flickering lamp cast an eerie dreamlike glimmer on two rows of students standing on one side of the schoolyard and a row of teachers on the other. In the middle, school, in the middle stood their principal, Norio Kojima, alongside the governor of Okinawa and Lieutenant Colonel Sano, of the Imperial Japanese Army. Hideki studied Sano, who stood rigid in his khaki uniform and knee-high leather boots. A sword hung from the lieutenant colonel's belt, and at the breast of his jacket was crowded with colorful ribbons. Hideki knew that all the other boys were as spellbound by Sano as he was. Sano was the one they wanted to be. They were gathered here now, outside their bomb shelters, because tonight, Hideki and his classmates were graduating early. The governor of Okinawa and a Japanese lieutenant colonel usually weren't in attendance at a graduation, and the ceremony wasn't usually held at two o'clock in the morning. But then, it wasn't every day America invaded your island either. Today was the end of everything Hideki had ever known. Later this morning, the enemy will land on Okinawa, Lieutenant Colonel Sano announced in his imposing voice as the bombs continued to fall. American devils, whose only purpose is to kill you and your families in the most brutal, merciless ways possible. Hideki shuddered, hoping that Sano and Yoshio wouldn't notice. 
They will hunt your grandparents down and burn them alive, Sano continued. They will torture your mothers, butcher your brothers and sisters. They will try to trick you too, offer you food and kindness. But the food they carry is poisoned, and the hand that beckons you with friendship hides the, the one behind their back holding a grenade. Ka Kum! Another bomb exploded nearby, destroying a tree that had stood for generations. But no one was going anywhere now. Sano had their attention. Haideki knew that America and Japan had been at war for almost four years, fighting each other all over the Pacific in places like the Smolian Island, Islands, the Philippines, and Iwo Jima. Then, a year ago, the Imperial Japanese Army had arrived in force on Okinawa to dig defenses for the inevitable, inevitable American invasion. Okinawa was a tiny island just 110 kilometers long and 11 kilometers wide. It lay south of the Japanese mainland and had once been an independent kingdom with its own language and religion. But Japan had annexed Okinawa and made it a province back when Haideki's grandparents were children. And now, because Okinawa belonged to Japan, the American army was coming to attack. From this moment, Sano went on, his voice heavy with importance. You have graduated from students to soldiers. You are now the blood and iron student corps. Each of you must be ready to die a glorious death in the name of the emperor. This is your island. It is you who should be fighting for it, not the Imperial Japanese army. You must fight like demons to protect your homeland. One plane for one battleship, one man for 10 of the enemy. Another bomb exploded nearby and Haideki cowered. He agreed with Sano. But if this ceremony went on too much longer, he would never get to trade his life for 10 American soldiers. An American battleship would kill him and all the rest of the students with one shot. Fearless as he was, Sano seemed to come to the same conclusion. He nodded and one of his lieutenants went down the row and put two grenades into the hands of each middle schooler. Hideki glanced at, at Takashi and at Katsumasa in disbelief. The IJA was giving them real grenades. Haideki accepted his two grenades. Each was cylindrical, like a drinking cup, and weighed about a pound. They were a little bigger than Haideki's hands and looked like pineapple-shaped lanterns, painted shiny black. What's this? Yoshio asked, and Haideki turned to look. Yoshio had been given two grenades that were different from Haideki's. Yoshio's grenades were made out of pottery. The American naval blockade has some metal, has made metal scarce, the lieutenant explained. Some of you will be given ceramic grenades. Ceramic, Yoshio said when the lieutenant moved down the line. But if these crack, they're useless. He glanced up and saw Haideki had been given two metal grenades and quickly took them without asking, pushing his pottery grenades into Haideki's hands with a wolfish grin. Haideki wanted to complain, but he knew it was pointless and would only make things worse with Yoshio. Okay, so that is the end of our first chapter. I hope it intrigued you. Um, this is a historical fiction about World War II by Alan Grants, author of Refugee. Uh, if this interested you at all, we do have copies in our library, or you can get them at the public library, or as always, you can buy your own copy.